Don't let me interrupt you, Jamie. It's not quite all right. Um, let me start with some opening comments. Over the past two days, Secretary Blinken has been meeting with people from across the department to discuss the work ahead of us over the next 74 days between now and January 20th. In those meetings, he has emphasized two points. First, the peaceful transfer of power is an essential element of our democracy that is vital to our nation's security. That's why it's so important for us to conduct a smooth, efficient, and professional transition process. To that end, the Secretary has appointed Ambassador Stephen Mull, a distinguished member of the State Department family, to coordinate these efforts on behalf of the department. Ambassador Mull will work with the President-elect's team to ensure as successful a transition as possible. Second, the Secretary has made clear that he intends to use his remaining time in office to make tangible progress on a number of critical issues, cementing our work and maintaining a free, open, prosperous Indo-Pacific and ensuring we continue to win the competition we're engaged in with China while responsibly managing the relationship between our two countries, ensuring that Ukraine is in the best position possible for success, and bringing an end to the fighting in Lebanon and Gaza while improving the delivery of humanitarian assistance, securing the release of all hostages, and preventing the further spread of the conflict. We have no shortage of work to do over the next 74 days, and we are determined to make the most of the time left. As the President said today, let's make every day count. That's the responsibility we have to the American people. And with that, Matt, Hi. you're up. Uh, okay, so um, uh, to, to that end, has Ambassador Mull started? Uh, Ambassador Mull has started his work uh, on behalf of the department. He's here. Um, uh, he's been attending meetings, uh, getting ready to coordinate the process. We have not yet um, had contact made by the Trump transition team. There's a process that they go through writ large that's run by the GSA. And then I think, as you know, uh, they appoint agency review teams that interface with each agency. They have not yet done that with respect to the State Department. I can't speak to other agencies. But as soon as they do, we are ready to go and working with them. OK, because I, 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 I just I took a stroll through the transition area and it was there was nobody there. Maybe he was at lunch. <laughs> I don't know. He's here. I, I, I was in a meeting oh, yeah. with I was in a meeting with him this morning. So okay. I can I can assure you he is here hard at work. Okay, but well, what exactly is he doing? No. So yeah, if there's been no contact with the incoming transition team. So we have been working on transition activities for some time now, even before he was appointed. What we what we do before the team is appointed, and we were doing this to get ready for either a Trump tr transition or a Harris transition is to put together briefing materials, both on policy and procedures, and to get them ready um, uh, and to try and anticipate questions that the incoming transition team will have and be ready to answer those as soon as they have an agency review team that uh, comes into the building. OK, uh, and, and, but there, there's no deadline for them to show up, is there? I mean, this is not the first time. This is like the, they, the seventh transition that I've there's and there's not a deadline. I suppose January twentieth would be a deadline. But no, they can no. they can they can they can I, they, I, we are ready to go. They can they can proceed with the process as soon as they're ready, and we are. That's okay. up to them. That's but, up for them to decide. We're ready. For, we're ready on our well, end. Well, what I'm saying, what, what I'm saying is that, like I said, I've done the, been through this multiple times. So, it, and it's been my experience in the past that the the incoming <clears throat> transition team never usually shows up but this early after an election, and you're, you're saying that. That's exactly this. Yeah, the, they, they have not. I won't speak to past precedent, but that's um, <clears throat> happening at this point. Okay. Uh, I, I'm sure people have questions about this, but I want to go to the Middle East. Too. Yeah. Um, but I'll wait until the transition. Transition stuff before we go, other transition things. Well, take us uh, Go ahead. Um, how is the State Department and the, I guess, how is the State Department planning to handle um, conflicting policy goals in the Middle East between the current and the incoming administration, meaning uh, the incoming president has said that he's not, he doesn't necessarily feel that a ceasefire deal in Gaza is the best way to resolve the war. We obviously know Secretary Blinken, President Biden are like a hundred million percent committed to that. Is it something um, where there's room for uh, sort of talking about it in negotiations, or do you continue 100%? On I think it's very important to remember, with respect to our policy in the Middle East and with respect to all of our policies, that there is one president at a time. And Joe Biden is the president, 
and we will continue to pursue the policies that he has set forward. Uh, when it comes to the Middle East, we will continue to pursue an end to the war in Gaza, an end to the war in Lebanon, a surge of humanitarian assistance. And that is our duty to pursue those policies right up until noon on January 20th. And when the president-elect takes office and becomes the president of the United States, he is, of course, his right to pursue different policies, but it's still incumbent upon us that we think to pursue the policies that we believe are best situated to bring peace and stability to the region and advance the national security interests of the United States, and that's what we're going to do. Do you um, anticipate on the other side of the equation that the Israelis, the Palestinians, Hamas um, might change their calculations based on that expectation that we're about to have an incoming president who might veer 180 degrees on policy um, from the current administration? So I certainly can't speak for another government or another entity, and I wouldn't want to speculate about how they might approach this period. Obviously, foreign governments have been through transitions before. Um, we had one four years ago, we had one before that, four years before that, we had one eight years before that. And so they're used to dealing with transitions. I think they understand that you have one president at a time. So I won't try to speculate about how they might deal with the various issues that we have before us. I do believe, and the Secretary continues to believe, that an end to the conflict in Gaza is not just in the interest of the Palestinian people, but is in Israel's interest. And finding a way forward that provides not just short-term security, but lasting security for Israelis and Palestinians alike is in the interest of the government of Israel. And so we will continue to have those conversations with them. But as you have always heard us say, they're a sovereign country and they will make their own decisions. And that's true in the transition as it was true before election day. I guess, so how can you, not you personally, but the State Department, the Biden administration, continue to reassure allies, um, particularly Israel, of long-term stability measures when you really only have a say for another however many, eight weeks, whatever we've got left? We can make clear to them the policies that we will pursue over the time that we have remaining in office. and. We can make clear to them what we believe is in the best interest of the United States, what we believe is in the best interest of the countries in the region. But of course, an incoming president can make his own policy changes, changes, his own policy decisions. Every president has the right to do that. And I think foreign governments are well aware of that, as the American people are well, well aware of that. Yeah. yeah. Can you have some insight if the secretary has uh, given any calls or spoken to any of his counterparts uh, around the world? Uh, as to, you know, either reassure them on the transition or how the U.S. policy is going to change or be impacted. Uh, could you give us some, um, uh, any information you have uh, on yeah, the calls? Yeah, he, he has had a number of calls over the, the past 24 hours. And without reading out any of those specifically, I will say generally, um, the message he has had to them has been the same message that you've heard me deliver just in the past five or 10 minutes, however long I've been up here. And that's that we are gonna pursue the policies that we are advancing um, when it comes to the Middle East, when it comes to uh, the Indo-Pacific, when it comes to supporting Ukraine, and of course, the many other policies, when it comes to trying to, to advance stability in Haiti and trying to reach a ceasefire in Sudan, uh, many of the other uh, 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 hotspots we're dealing with around the world. Um, and I think, they all have heard from us privately what they see publicly, what you saw from the President of the United States today, that we are committed to a peaceful, successful transition. That is a commitment that we take seriously. It's part of our oath of, of it's a part of how we interpret our oath of office. It's part of how we interpret our duty to the American people. Um, when it comes to the, how you frame the question about ma making reassurances to allies or partners about the policies of a future administration, that's not something we can do. It's not something we would do. We would never presume to speak for an incoming administration because <laughs> President-elect was elected by the American public. He has the right to make his own decisions. He will make his own decisions. So we will speak on what we believe are the right policies that we have set, and we'll make clear what we believe is in the long-term interest of the United States. But the uh, uh, the incoming president will make his own decisions. And, I, and I, here's the thing. As I said in response to, to the, the previous question, 
These countries are used to dealing with the United States. They understand that we have elections every four years, and they understand that there are changes in policy that flow as a result of those elections. There were significant changes in policy four years ago when <coughs> President Biden took office. Um, and without speaking to what those may be, because it wouldn't be appropriate for me to, to, to do that, I, I couldn't possibly speak for another administration. I think everyone well, well understands that's how democracies work. Yeah. You, you don't care to share uh, any of these particular readouts? We may have calls that we read out over, over the, the, I mean, the coming days. We may, we may have calls that we read out over the coming hours and through our normal process. But I just meant when I, when I speak to the, the, this kind of general conversation, I don't want to say with respect to in, any uh, particular Specific. foreign minister. Yeah. But are we talking just to have a sense of really working the phones, or is it just a, Sad, a, number, a number of calls? I, I would look for, for you know, us to be reading out calls over the, the coming days. Yeah. Thanks. Um, on these. Uh, calls. Um, can you say who uh, the Secretary is now liaising with in terms of who his counterpart is with Israel, given um, that uh, there is a new Israeli Defense Minister? Um, does he have any communication yet with Israel Katz? And um, can you give a bit more details on whether he's had a conversation with the Israeli uh, Defense Minister since he switched roles? He has not yet spoken with the new Defense Minister since he assumed his current role uh, two days ago. Uh, as you know, the uh, Israel Katz was the Foreign Minister. Before that, he um, uh, met with uh, the Foreign Minister on one of our previous trips to Israel. The Secretary um, has conversations with a with. Uh, not a fairly wide range, but an extensive range of Israeli counterparts. Of course, he meets with the prime minister when we're in the region, and he talks at times with uh, the minister for strategic affairs. He talked to the previous defense minister. I'm sure he will talk to the current defense minister in the coming days, but he hasn't uh, in the two days since he took the job. Okay, and we're, um, I think, a little under a week away from this deadline with Secretary Blinken and Secretary Austin's letter to the Israelis. Um, can you give any updates beyond what you've already said in previous briefings on any um, things that Israel has ticked off that list uh, ahead of next week and also uh, as well in the letter, could you give an update on the channel that uh, the US is hoping to um, uh, establish with Israel on splitting harm? Let me take the second question first with respect to the channel. Um, uh, we have had conversations with them in the past week or so about establishing the first meeting of that channel. Uh, the meet first meeting has not yet taken place, but we're hoping to uh, to land that meeting and have it, have it take place um, in the coming days, in the next week or two. Uh, it's something that continues to be a priority for us. When it comes to progress on the other steps that the Secretary laid out in the, le in the letter to improve the delivery of uh, humanitarian assistance, we have seen Israel take a number of important steps over the past several weeks, including in just the, the past few days. Uh, they reopened Erez Crossing, as you heard me report before, but they have uh, uh, also informed us that in the coming days, in the next few days, they plan to, an, op to open an additional new crossing at K uh, Kisufum. Uh, they have approved additional delivery routes inside Gaza, which is something that is critical because, as you know, the problem has not only been getting humanitarian assistance to the crossings, but then getting it out of the crossings and getting it delivered to the uh, people who need them. So routes such as the uh, Beni Shuhela Road in southern Gaza, uh, they have uh, approved expanded use of the Israeli fence road and are currently repairing the coastal road to get that road operational for the delivery of assistance. Um, they are now allowing convoys into areas in the north that have been closed for weeks and that you have heard us say needed to be open to allow humanitarian assistance in. The first convoy today went through Jabalia into Beit Hanun, uh, the first convoy in several weeks. That is a, uh, something that we have emphasized is critical. Um, the people who have been in those areas have uh, uh, had not had access to sufficient food and water, and we have made clear that that needed to change, and we saw the first convoy go to, um, uh, to Beit Hanun today. We have seen them take increased efforts to stop looting. They've paved new routes to try and bypass some of the areas where trucks have been um, uh, 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 looted repeatedly. And we've seen some initial expansion of the Mwasi area, which, as you know, is something the Secretary specifically called for uh, in the letter. So, of course, what's important when you see all of these steps taken is what that means for the results, because it's not just sufficient to open new roads if more humanitarian assistance isn't going through those roads. So what we want to see over the coming days and coming weeks is to see these new routes actually have more humanitarian assistance delivered over them. So we have seen 
uh, a bit of an uptick uh, in the number of trucks. For example, two days ago, we saw 229 <laughs> enter uh, various crossings and saw 115 of them that were collected, uh, which is a bit of an increase over where we had been. Now, as always, when we give a metric like this, we wanna see that number continue to increase but the most important thing is that we see an increase is that it be sustained. And that is one of the critical metrics that we are looking at. Uh, sorry, just before it yeah. goes, go the channel, the, the, remind, remind me when, when did you give a deadline for that to be set up? We said we wanted to see the first meeting take place uh, by the end of October. It didn't take place by the end of October, right. but we're working to land the meeting and expect it to happen in the coming days or week or two. Well. Okay, if and when it happens, does that mean that they're essentially off the hook for not meeting the October 31st deadline? Um, so the two things about the there's two things about the I want to say about that. First of all, when you look at the the that portion of the letter, it's important to note that that was in, that was not tied to the humanitarian assistance piece. That was a separate deadline, right? It was a um, just right. I, I know you didn't say it, just make it clear because I think a lot of people have kind of um, conflated the two. What we, have, what we made clear in the letter is that we wanted to see that meeting take place. We've had a lot of communication with them about the appropriate level yes, at which that, hold on, at which that meeting should take place, the um, appropriate way for that meeting to take place. We asked for it virtual, uh, virtually, and what I think we're gonna land on is an actual in-person meeting um, and are working on exactly who attends that meeting and when it happens and hope to get that finalized in the next few days and be able to announce when it will happen, but we're not there yet. Well, I, I get that. I, I understood, but does that mean that they get uh, they they move from a failing grade to a passing grade? And when, so if and, when it, if and when it comes up, that's Look, not, not that is hold on. That's not the way we're looking at. We said we want to have the meeting. It didn't happen by when we wanted it to happen. We want to have it, have it happen as soon as possible. So there's no penalty for it. We want to see the meeting take place. Ultimately, what we care about is getting a result and is to get that right. channel established so we can start fair, to get information. I just in. want to know because I mean, if they're if, if you're going to say, oh, it's okay to blow through this deadline, but you still have the meeting, but it might not be for another two weeks, and but then it's okay, and you you don't regard it as them ignoring. We, we want to see it. We want to see it happen as soon as possible. We're continuing to press for it. All right. Sorry, sir. Yeah, sorry. Following on from <clears throat> from that, with the with the thirty day deadline, uh, in the letter it, it lays out. Well, it, it su suggests there will be implications for U.S. policy and law, um, given now that this administration is uh, only has a couple of months left. Um, what what is the downside to the, for Israel if they uh, if they don't follow your um, these these demands, uh, I don't want to speculate about what may or may not happen. We have made clear that there are potential legal and policy considerations uh, from failure to improve the humanitarian assistance situation in Gaza and implement a number of the steps that we outlined in the letter. We are in active discussion with them, including in the, in the past several days, about steps that they have taken and what more that they need to do. And we'll make an assessment um, when we get to the end of the period. And beyond that, I wouldn't want to speculate about what may or may not happen. And in, in the last, I guess, two days, um, do you have any sense that the, that your uh, your pressure is being taken less seriously as a result of you know anything that you do in the next two months would be able to be reversed? So we have seen them take. A, so I, I would just note that what we have seen, including over the last few days, in response to the letter that we sent them, and not just the letter, but in response to the repeated engagements we have had with them, both at the secretary's level, as you know, he talked to um, the uh, then defense minister on Monday, he talked to the minister of strategic affairs on Friday to make clear that we wanted to see further progress beyond the, what we had already seen, and engagements at other levels, including uh, through our ambassador, Jack Liu, and through our special envoy, Lise Grande. Um, we have continued to press them, and we have seen them, including in the past few days since the election, take additional steps. So I'm not going to try to judge why, you know, I'm not going to try to, 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 to make a judgment that's connected to the election one way or the other. We're just going to look at the facts, and we're looking at the facts as um, uh, uh, we're looking at the facts as they develop, and we'll make our assessments based on those facts. And you mentioned you would, the administration is going to do everything it can to, to get a ceasefire, um, both in Gaza and Lebanon, before before the end of the administration. 
particularly on Gaza, um, I think you had, there had obviously been mon- months of ceasefire talks, then around um, uh, around Tinwa's death, there was this effort to, to restart the talks that hasn't been successful. Uh, what is the state at, the, at this moment? Are, are there talks? Is there any prospect uh, for a ceasefire? Uh, are the sides engaging? Uh, we continue to talk to the mediators, to our fellow mediators, um, and continue to talk about whether there may be appropriate uh, formulations that could um, advance the ball and get us off the kind of stalemate that we've been in for some time. Uh, and it's been publicly reported that one of the proposals that we put forward with the other mediators, Hamas rejected um, last weekend. So that doesn't mean that we'll stop. We're going to continue to try to push to get a ceasefire and find a way to end the war. But um, uh, uh, it takes the, the parties being willing to engage on those efforts. Sai. Thank you, man. Uh, on the, the, does the letter envision a number of trucks, I mean, I don't recall, that should go in on any particular day? Uh, Did that include any figure? Uh, it does. I'll have to go back to the letter. Okay. I'll refer you back right. to the letter to look at the, the details. Okay, thank you. Um, I want to ask you about reports on Beit Lahia that it, be, it is being ethnically cleansed. Are you aware of these reports? And are you a, in a position, this administration does it have a plan or could it have a plan to prevent this from happening? So you know? I think that you were referring uh, again to the so-called general's plan. Yes. And I will just make clear that we have engaged directly with the government of Israel on this question. Right. The, the secretary raised it directly with the prime minister when we were there two weeks ago. The prime minister said, that is not our plan. It's not what we're implementing. They can speak for themselves. I'm just reporting what they said to us. And the secretary made clear both privately and publicly that we would firmly reject any such plan. And you have seen us push uh, for expanded humanitarian access into the areas where fighting is going on, into, including into these restricted areas. And as I just noted a moment ago, for t- today we saw for the first time in several weeks a convoy of humanitarian assistance actually go into Beit Hanun. Uh, uh, and it's important that that delivery of humanitarian assistance continue to those civilians that are in an area, even in an area where fighting is occurring. Mm-hmm. So, but you don't, you, know, you, you don't observe yourself that what is happening is basically, you know, I mean, I don't know if you want to term it that way, but it is like ethnic cleansing. It is like driving people out or trying to drive them out. So I'm not going to characterize. I will, the government of Israel can speak for itself right. what it is doing. What we are making clear to the government of Israel is we don't want to see people displaced from their homes. Now, look, if there is fighting in an area, Evacuation is an appropriate thing to, t- to, to occur. We've, this has long been the policy of the United States, long been the policy of other governments, that if a government is operating militarily in an area where civilians are sheltering, that you want to see civilians have the ability to evacuate their homes so they can move to safety. At the end of the fighting, however, we want to see them move back to their homes. We want to see them back, move back to their ne- neighborhoods and have the ability to rebuild their homes, uh, knowing that, of course, in many of these areas, their homes have been destroyed, their, their entire neighborhoods have been destroyed. In the meantime, while people are still in areas where fighting is going on, we want to make sure they get humanitarian access, and that's what we're going to continue to push for. But in this case, they have been moved back and forth many times, and they have been struck. Let me ask you about UNRWA. Uh, now, uh, UNRWA has told the Israelis that, you know, replacing UNRWA relief agency would be your responsibility, whatever that means. Now, I, we know that the, the president-elect back in 2018 uh, basically cut off aid uh, to UNRWA, so we know where they uh, stand. I want to ask you, is there anything that could possibly be done over the next few weeks uh, to make sure that UNRWA stays, that, you know, I don't mean to be snarky or flippant, to make it Trump-proof in any way, that the organization would continue to do? So we will continue to make clear that we support the work that UNRWA does. As you know, we are banned by an act of Congress from funding UNRWA. Um, uh, that, act, that law is not going to change before President Biden leaves office. But we support the work that UNRWA does. But um, as to what decisions will be made by the future president, I obviously can't speak to those. There will be uh, a new president on January 20th. They'll have their own, well, I assume they'll have their own press briefings, and you can show up and ask them the questions about that side. Can I ask you a question on uh, the tonnage of bombs dropped on Gaza? You know, it is said that 
85,000 tons of bone hazard. Do you, have a, do you have a figure? Can you confirm that I, or deny it? I, I don't have a figure, but I can tell you, obviously, the, the, the destruction of Gaza has been widespread, and the civilian harm that has emanated from that destruction has been widespread. I've seen over 40,000 people die, many of them civilians. And Said, it just goes to, to illustrate again why we are trying to reach an end to this conflict, and not just a temporary end to this conflict, which is always important to emphasize, but an end to this conflict that is durable and won't just lead to further conflict between um, uh, Israel and Hamas or Israel and other terrorist groups. We want to see Hamas replaced by a different governing authority in Gaza, and that's what we're trying to achieve. Thank you. And you have one of the objectives you highlighted in your office, and it was in Ukraine, you said, we're going to make sure Ukraine is in the best position for success. Uh, can you give us a sense of how you're going to spend next two months to ensure just to do just that? Anything different than you have? So I don't have any new... I, mm -hmm. uh, sorry, were you, were you, uh, uh, were you still going with the question? <laughs> on, uh, yeah, on, uh, for instance, funding. Will with what? With, uh, funding issues. But you'll be working with the Congress on new supplemental, and also will you ensure that seized Russian assets, all of them, are transferred to Ukraine? So I don't have any new announcements to uh, make today, but I can tell you that the president has already made clear that the funding that Congress has been made available, we are working to get all of it out of the door, uh, all of the drawdown authority out of the door to Ukraine before the end of his term. And when it comes to the, um, uh, the sovereign assets, we have also made clear that we're trying to operationalize that money as well before the end of the term. And for the details of that, I'd refer you to the Department of Treasury, which, of course, is the primary agency um, Thank you. In, for, in terms of for, for that, that particular aspect. Sure. In terms of capabilities, you made some what? change capabilities. In May, you changed some capabilities. You know, you allowed them to use your American weapons uh, to hit back inside Russia. Uh, you know, that was in response to Kharkiv operation. And now, given the fact that North Koreans are already fighting, uh, you know, in different uh, zones, um, will you be le ready to let them use those weapons in the uh, <coughs> first area? We are consulting with our allies and partners about the appropriate response to the deployment of North Korean soldiers inside uh, Kursk to potentially engage in combat with, uh, or I should say against Ukrainian soldiers, but I don't have any announcements to make today. I'm just having a hard time to understand what is the red I don't line. think you I are. Mean, you know, when they train, <laughs> start training, you said you were concerned. I'm sorry? When they start training North Koreans, you said you were concerned. When they move them to the zone, you know, fighting, deployed to the fighting zone, you said you were deeply concerned. I hope for you will stop being concerned and act, actually. So, Alex, I appreciate the fact that you ignored the answer that I just gave you, but if you would listen again to the answer I said, we are consulting with our allies and partners about what the response should be right now. And I'm not going to preview what that response will be because it's appropriate that we have those conversations with our allies and partners. I think it's important to remember that the response to Russia's aggression against Ukraine has not been just a United States response. It's especially important to remember this in, in, in the context of some of the other questions I'm getting today. It is a response that we have organized on behalf of more than 50 countries. And so we are going to consult with them about what the appropriate response should be, whether it be from the United States, whether it be from other countries, whether it be a joint response uh, like we have undertaken today. And on that line, Matt, there's a One report. more, and then I'll go to Janet. Thanks so much. The reports that you know, the U.S. government is preventing Sweden from uh, sending badly needed AVAX uh, aircrafts to Ukraine. Why would you do that? I haven't seen that report, uh, Alex. I can't comment on the veracity of it. Janet. Thank you, Thank you Matt. Uh, I have a few questions on Russia and North Korea and China. Russia recently uh, conducted a new strategic nuclear exercises, and uh, North Korea's Kim Jong-un announced that the preparations had been completed at the Punggye-ri nuclear site. Meanwhile, the vice chairman of Russia's National Security Council warned that the United States was mistaken in thinking that it would not use nuclear weapons and said that Russia's use of nuclear weapons was inevitable. What concerns do you have about the nuclear alliance between North Korea and Russia? So we continue to have concerns about the um, deepening security partnership between Russia and North Korea. And with respect to those uh, uh, comments, I'd say they're reckless. And as always, we would uh, uh, urge Russian government officials to making, against making such 
reckless statements. The, the, the North Korean foreign minister Choi Son Hee met with the Russian President Putin and the Foreign Minister Lavrov and the President to work together until Russia wins the war in Ukraine. Do you think that North Korea's actual involvement in the Ukraine war will prolong the war? Uh, I don't want to speculate. I can tell you that on behalf of the United States, we are going to continue to uh, support Ukraine. We are going to continue to support them on the battlefield, and we are going to continue to work to um, maintain the alliance that we have put together to back Ukraine uh, to respond to Russia's aggression. Lastly, uh, yeah. in China, a spokesperson for Chinese foreign minister said that uh, dispatching North Korean troops and the North Korea-Russia military alliance is something North Korea and Russia can do as a sovereign nation. What is the, your assessment of uh, this? You've heard us speak to this before. We think that the deepening security partnership between Russia and North Korea, and, and certainly the deployment of North Korean uh, troops to engage in combat against Ukrainian soldiers is something that ought to be of concern to everyone in the region. We've raised those concerns directly with China, uh, said to them that we believe this should be a concern of theirs, and it's something that they should raise with both countries. Thank you. Thank you. I'm following up on Simon's question on the negotiations uh, post Sinwar. Afterwards, the immediate question on the State Department's mind was, is Hamas going to be willing to negotiate in good faith? Are they actually interested in reaching a deal? I know you said that they rejected the proposal that was put on the table over the weekend, but have you made a determination on whether they are willing to actually accept any proposal? So it's not a, an assessment we make um, uh, sort of across the board. It's an assessment we make based on their actual responses um, to proposals that are put on, a ta on the table. Um, and what we have seen since the death of Sinwar so far is they're not willing to engage in, in, uh, on those proposals. Now, that doesn't mean it won't change. Doesn't mean we shouldn't go back and work with our allies and partners to try and find a, a, a way to um, bridge the divides and get a ceasefire that would get all the hostages home and would set the table for a broader into the conflict that of course is what we're trying to do but just when you look at their just just judging on initial actions by the hamas leadership in the several weeks since uh sinmar died they rejected the first proposal that was put on the table so when secretary blinken went to the middle east in the wake of uh sinmar's killing he said that there was a clear moment and the effort was to try to seize it is it fair to say that that optimism has dwindled um we still we still believe that that there's a moment that we ought to capitalize on and that, that we ought to seize. And we continue to look um, to try and see if there are other proposals that can get us to yes, and whether there are different ways to uh, put things forward that would, uh, as I said, bridge the divide and kind of break through this, this log jam that, that we've been in. We're not going to give up on this effort because it's uh, too important to the Palestinian civilians who are suffering. It's too important to the hostages that are suffering. It's too important to the long-term peace and stability of the region. So we're going to continue to push forward despite the, the obstacles. Yeah, Robbie. Uh, Turkey, uh, along with 52 countries, submitted a letter to the United Nations urging for and halt to arms uh, transfers to Israel. And there are increasing calls on this issue. Is there any possibility uh, that the Biden administration might consider halting uh, our weapons shipments to Israel if you know Israel does not meet the demands outlined in the letter? So we made clear in, in the letter, and I made clear from the podium, that there are potential policy and legal ramifications that flow from uh, Israel not being in compliance with U.S. law. And we're going to follow the law. I won't, don't, do not uh, want to speculate about where that's going to land. We're going to continue to look at the progress that they have made and make our assessments based on those prog on that progress. Can you elaborate more on you know what do you mean by following the law? It means that we're going to follow the law. If you look at 620i, uh, which is the the uh, thank you for the laugh, Matt. If you look at if you look at wow. six. Uh, you know, follow the law means follow it, the law. it means we're going to follow the law. And I'm about to elaborate but on it. I think she, oh, if you if you if you look at yeah if you look at if you know if you look at 620i, which is the version of the Foreign Assistance Act, it makes clear that um, countries need to 
um, not take any steps to impede the delivery of foreign assistance. That's the uh, exact um, uh, statute that the letter references. And so we're going to look at their compliance with that statute and uh, make the appropriate judgments under it. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, I don't know how many briefings you are going to address uh, before the transition, but just wanted to say we will miss you and Vedant <laughs> <That's, laughs> because you that's, that's, because you guys are uh, you guys are true image of the values this country stands for. The way you deal with the foreign journalists, I really appreciate that. That's kind um, of you. Thank you. I wish um, I could believe I spoke, you spoke for all of your colleagues. But <laughs> no, I'm just. I will miss all of you as well. But my I'm, personal opinion. You know, as, they, as they say in uh, my Python, I'm not dead yet. Uh, so, 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 <laughs> so people are. Uh, uh, People are celebrating in different parts of the world, like in Pakistan, India, North Korea, Russia. Um, the majority of the Pakistani people believe that Trump will get Iran out of prison. I was talking uh, to a Russian diplomat this morning, and he told me that Russia is getting prepared to negotiate uh, ongoing war uh, with the upcoming Trump administration. Arab Americans also hope that Trump will bring uh, peace in the Middle East. So do you really think that the current foreign policy is one of the issues your administration lost the elections? Uh, I am not in any way going to speculate on the outcome of the elections. It would, there are, uh, if you turn on cable news, there are any number of, of uh, pundits who will give you all sorts of different reasons on, on how the election was decided, but certainly not appropriate for me to speculate from a U.S. government uh, podium about what those reasons might have been. A few media reports claim that White House plans to rush billions of dollars in security assistance to Ukraine before President Joe Biden leaves office in January as yes, uh, Trump has been critical of Biden's system for Ukraine. Is it true, rushing billions of dollars to Ukraine before the transition? Yeah, the, we've been quite uh, open about that, that the money that was appropriated in the supplemental, that we uh, intend to do everything in our power to get all that deployed to Ukraine before the end of the year. I'm oh, sorry, before the end of the term, excuse me. Yeah, go ahead. I'll come back to you. Go ahead. Thank you, sir. My name is Peter Meyer. I think we have quite a I want, I want to ask about the, the collapsing German government that we see in the last days. Uh, can you make any remarks about uh, the impl implications that may have on uh, the U.S. and on uh, U.S. foreign policy? And also let me join the gentleman to thank you for the uh, cooperation thank with foreign uh, Thank you. That's, that's nice of you. So I, uh, uh, Germany, of course, is a valued NATO ally and an indispensable par dispensable partner of the United States. We have full confidence in the strength of Germany's democratic process and will continue to work with Germany on our shared priorities. Go ahead, I'll come to you next. Excuse me, Matt. The, the Knesset just has passed a final law to expire the families of Palestinians who carry out like attacks against Israel. And this law is aiming to imprison at children as young as 14. Uh, do you support these measures, like which some uh, like activists and uh, 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 legal experts consider it as a collective uh, punishment? Let me take the question back. Only I saw just before I came in here that um, Israel had passed the law, but I want to look into it more. Uh, I want to look into it uh, a little deeper before I get you a, a, okay. a full answer. Okay. The second question is like, um, <laughs> do Palestinians have right to full sovereignty in making their own decision without interference from you or Israel, for instance? Like if they choose any group you and Israel doesn't like to rule their lands and something like that, are you going to impose any sanction on them or not? Because like you don't impose any sanction on Israel when they don't like uh, follow your like decision or like they don't apply your ideas or something like that. Like so I'm not like do Palestinians they have I, the same right? Like, I, I'm Israel? not. I, I, we, so I'm not sure what you mean by choosing um, uh, uh, a group to to rule their own land. I would say that we, we I say we, we let me just say we absolutely support the Palestinian people's right to self-determination, to fulfill their legitimate aspirations, and that's why it has been the policy of the, the United States, and it's one that we have actively pursued to try to establish an independent Palestinian state. And yeah, it can do, we continue to believe that is in the best interest of the Palestinian people and also in the interests of yeah. the, the government of Israel. Like, and that, that, is, that is what we are pursuing. True. Like, like for a like concrete example, like Palestinians in 2006, they chose Hamas to rule Gaza in this time. Like, so it means... And we see how that has worked out for everyone in the region quite yeah, terribly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, this is like Palestinian decision. I'm uh, Egyptian, not Palestinian. <laughs> right. But like, I'm just saying, like, this still is like a Palestinian issue. Like we see China like hosting them for negotiation. So like it means Palestinians themselves still recognize Hamas as a part of Palestinians. And they go China, go Russia, go Global South, 
and it seems like complicated. Like how USA look at this complicated uh, uh, choosing people at, at the end so, of the day, all of them are Palestinian. So we reject uh, a terrorist organization <laughs> controlling any government anywhere in the world. The bottom line policy of the United States, something that we reject, something that we do not uh, support. And we believe that most Palestinians don't want to see a terrorist organization govern the Palestinian people. If you look at the results of a terrorist organization governing Hamas, it has been a war that has wreaked widespread destruction on Gaza and led to the death of more than 40,000 Palestinians. So now, or I said, they told well, no, I, I, I'll just say, but the, the, what we want to see is a pathway to two states. State of Israel and independent Palestinian state. And that's what we're going to continue to try to pursue. There's just no other way to, to put it than that. Go ahead. Thank you, sir. A few questions. Number one, um, today was actually Yoav Gallant's final day as defense minister to support of Israeli law. He held a, a farewell call with Secretary Austin today. Considering he's one of the addressees on that 30-day letter, did Secretary Blinken hold any last minute call with, with Minister Gala? He hasn't talked to him today. Obviously, he's talked to him a number of times, both in person and over the phone. He's uh, talked to him as recently as Monday. We saw uh, Yoav Golan as a, a valuable partner that we have worked with on a number of issues. Um, and we will continue to work with his replacement as the defense minister. Ultimately, the, the letter was addressed to him in his capacity as defense minister, not his personal capacity. So the function will carry over to his replacement. In terms of the talks that are ongoing up until, I would presume, January 20th on um, potential hostage and ceasefire deal. President Trump has famously not wanted his political rivals to get any kind of wins, as he called it, or usurp any achievements that he may have. Is there any concern Egypt, Qatar, based on their reliance on the next administration, may lessen their cooperation here down the home stretch with the U.S.? I cannot speak for any other government or what they will do or what they might not do. I would just point out that an end to the war in Gaza is not a win for Joe Biden. An end to the war in Gaza is a win for the region. And ultimately, it is a win for the Israeli and Palestinian people. And I think everyone in the region understands that this is a war we want to bring to an end as soon as possible. And no one should be waiting for 74 days to, and letting this suffering go on any longer than it should have if there's a path to bring it to an end before then. Last question for you. Uh, President Obama famously in his final days approved an abstention at the UN Security Council on a, on a key vote involving Israel. Uh, uh, most analysts say it's as a result of you know personal animosity between Obama and then Prime Minister Netanyahu. Are there any promises, any guarantees about these final days at the UN and whether President Biden will continue to support Israel as he has? So you should not read this into this answer I'm about to give anything. You shouldn't read it in one way or the other. I cannot speculate on how we will vote on resolutions that are not yet even before the Security Council. Obviously, we will look at any resolution that comes up before the Security Council and make the make our judgments based on the interests of the United States, as we always do. Yeah. In practical terms, um, what will happen to the incidents that are being investigated and assessed by this building? Um, you know, some 500 incidents about what Israel has done in Gaza. Will any conclusions from those investigations see the light of day before there's a transition? How how might that process be impacted? I know there's Cherg, I know there's lawyers working yeah. in this building. Can you say whether there will be any, how do you make sure that this administration's work on those incidents will see light of day and be part of what, what you guys have done so that that's public? So I can't put a timetable on when we will reach conclusion to any of those investigations, but I can say that the obligation to follow the law is not an obligation that stops when there is a, a change in government, a change in power. Every administration has the obligation to follow the law and to um, look into potential um, uh, misuse of, of weapons that have been provided by the United States or potential uh, violations of international humanitarian law. Um, that's just the law. Are you worried, though, that, that that could be impacted at all? Like, 
again, like that's why I'm asking whether there could be any conclusions. Are there any conclusions that this administration would want to reach on any of those incidents? We want, so we want to reach those conclusions as soon as we can, separate and apart from uh, January 20th and separate and apart from any change in government. And that's true whether Vice President Harris had been elected. It's true now that uh, Donald Trump has been elected. It's something that we um, are working to bring to a conclusion as soon as we can. But any work that is midstream in a change of, of government, if it's work that's required under the law, that's work that's supposed to continue. Just come back to uh, your uh, next. You yeah. mentioned on um, that you're going to try to try to deploy all the appropriated aid for Ukraine before the end of the administration. Is there anything beyond um, this sort of deploying what's already been appropriated by Congress that this administration can do? to, as you said, put Ukraine in the strongest possible position? Nothing that I'm ready to announce today, but we will uh, continue to consult with our allies and partners. We have a number of upcoming multilateral meetings where we will be talking about the issue of Ukraine with uh, the coalition of countries that we have put together. And we'll be talking about work that we can do and we'll be talking about work that they can do to continue to ensure Ukraine's success. And if if the, you know, the, the president-elect has um, spoken about solving the, the conflicts, in the first 24 hours in office, um, you know, obviously, but um, uh, I'm, I'm interested in whether in the, the last two months of, of the administration, uh, would you facilitate talks on, on ending the war in Ukraine uh, if, if both parties sort of express a willingness to, to, to start talking towards that? So if President Zelensky decides that he wants to enter negotiations, of course, that's something that we would support. That has been our policy, our longstanding policy. It is up for President Zelensky to decide when it's time for negotiations. It's not something that is appropriate for us or for any other country to push him into. And we would support him in any process to try and ensure a just and lasting peace. But that is ultimately his decision, not ours. Um, but as always, and you can just look at the statements that he continues to make. We have seen no indication from Vladimir Putin that he is willing to drop his demand to continue to gobble up Ukrainian territory. I'm sure there's a negotiation that Putin would accept where he gets everything that he wants and Ukraine gets nothing that it is entitled to under the law. But that is not a negotiation that President Zelensky has been interested in, nor should it be. Under, under what law? Under, under, well, under the, under the UN Charter that Ukraine can maintain its own borders and maintain its territorial integrity, sovereignty. Go ahead, then we'll wrap for today. Thank you, sir. Two questions, please. I just came back from a short trip to India, and uh, in India, all over India, people are talking about that there are uh, attacks going on Indian American community and also especially Hindus in uh, Bangladesh, in Pakistan, in Afghanistan, and also a few incidents in the U.S. and also in Canada. My question is now, even President-elect Mr. Trump, President Trump also spoke about atrocities against Hindus in Bangladesh and during his uh, uh, campaign. So what U.S. is doing as far as this uh, atrocities going on against Hindus in Bangladesh because after the departure of Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina and interim Prime Minister Mr. Mohammed Yunus said, if these attacks continues, he will uh, resign the post, but uh, attacks are still going on. He's still uh, on, on his post as prime minister. So um, we discussed this uh, in the past. We have in our discussions with uh, Bangladeshi officials made clear that we want to see freedom of religion respected and any attacks. We want to see people held accountable uh, as is appropriate under Bangladeshi law. And that's true of our position in Bangladesh. It's true uh, anywhere in the world. And second, sir, yeah. as far as this election is concerned, um, four years of U.S.-India relations uh, under Biden administration, of course, uh, Secretary of State have been many times to India and back and forth visits. So do we see any changes as far as diplomatic relations, people-to-people -people relations, visa, or even uh, um, diplomacy and among others under the new administration, especially people-to-people -people because they are talking in India, all the people are talking about that uh, uh, visa is the main concern between the two countries over there in India. So um, I'll repeat myself in, in a way that I'll probably have to repeat myself a number of times between now and January 20th, and that I can't speak, of course, for the new administration. Um, but I will say that the um, strengthening of our ties with India is something 
uh, that this administration is incredibly proud of, um, both through our increased alliances, through the Quad, through our work on a number of shared priorities. Uh, it's something that we focused on from day one and something that we see as a great success as we prepare to leave office. Thanks. With that, wrap for today. Thanks, everyone.